The first session this afternoon is about the structural heart disease. I would like to first introduce my panelists for this session, Dr. Randy Carter and Dr. Paul Moore. I have known these two cardiothoracic surgeons for the last 15 years. Both are extremely talented and skilled and have done an outstanding job for the community of South Central Kentucky. Both worked at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. before coming to Bowling Green, Kentucky. There was a recent article published in one of the consumer reports regarding cabbage outcomes. Bowling Green Medical Center ranked 21 in the whole nation. I'm pretty sure this would not have happened without their hard work and diligence. I welcome now Dr. Carter and Dr. Moore to the stage. Next, we have Dr. Kendra Grubb, a cardiovascular surgeon and an assistant professor of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery at the University of Louisville. She was trained in cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Virginia and then moved on to do training in interventional cardiology at Columbia University in New York, making her the first woman in the United States doubly trained in CT surgery and interventional cardiology. Dr. Grubb is a principal investigator for the International Partner Trial and co-chair of the National Percutaneous Valve Clinical Standards Committee. Please welcome Dr. Kendra Grubb. Now, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. James Slater, Robert and Mark Bell Professor of Medicine, Director of Cardiac Catheterization Lab at New York University. Dr. Slater is going to talk to us about the historic development and our present understanding of the transcatheter aortic valve replacement and its evolution into a sophisticated technology with broader indications. Dr. James Slater has been a principal investigator of the major landmark trials in the field of cardiology, some of them being shock trial in early 90s. Timmy 10, Timmy 12, Pursuit, Gusto 3, Tactics, and many more, including the newer trial like Everest 2, which dealt with the percutaneous mitral valve versus surgical mitral valve repair in patients with mitral regurgitation. Lastly, he was involved with Evolute Core Valve in tower treatment. I'm very fortunate to have trained one-on-one -on -one with very best. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting my mentor, my teacher, Dr. James Slater. Thank you, Mohammed, for that very kind introduction, and it's really an honor for me to be here. It's, uh, it's a very well-populated uh, symposium, and, uh, and I'm sure you're all finding it very entertaining. Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to talk to you today about what I've called the Taver Revolution. And I use the word revolution because when you think about a revolution like the French Revolution, it starts in 1789 and in about 15 years you have Napoleon rampaging all over Europe. Or in 1917, the Bolsheviks take over and by 1930, you know, the Soviet Union is a completely different place than it was under the Tsars. And that's about the time frame of this, of the, is the introduction and the adoption of this technology as I, I think I'll hopefully make clear to you. Uh, my disclosures are just some honoraria for Medtronic uh, uh, to participate on various panels. Well, this is aortic valve disease. This is aortic valve stenosis. There is no medical therapy for this disease, so we don't have to talk about any drugs or anything much at all because it doesn't work. And once you develop symptomatic aortic stenosis, you are dead. You have an 80% chance of being dead by two years. So it's a very ugly disease, and it's as ugly or more ugly than really most ma malignancies. And we have a very good therapy for it. You can see there on the next uh, slide there that aortic valve replacement kind of stops that terrible, relentless decline uh, towards, uh, uh, towards mortality. The, one of the problems is that a lot of people say, I really don't want that operation, even though I know it's going to save my life, even though I know it's going to make me feel better, even though I, I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to allow me to live out my natural lifespan, I don't want that operation. And one of the reasons for that is that most of the people with severe aortic stenosis are elderly. 
And you, if you look at these trials that I'm going to present to you, the average age of patients in these trials runs around 84, 85. And that's a very common time for people to present with severe aortic stenosis. And, and people are not enthusiastic about undergoing open heart surgery at that stage in their life. And this has been shown in Europe, in the United States. These are people with severe aortic stenosis, declining surgery. Here's a little deeper dive in that from the University of Michigan. There's 155 patients with severe aortic stenosis that their echo lab identified, and 48% of them had no referral for surgery. And of those people that weren't referred for surgery, 71% of them were symptomatic. So they had symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So you say, well, why didn't they go to surgery? Is they must have just been ridiculously high risk or you know, one thing or another, but they weren't. If you look, you see uh, that of the, of the symptomatic patients that were not referred for surgery, 25% or almost half had an STS risk score of less than 5%. So there is a tremendous reluctance among patients to, you know, to take this next step at this, at this age, and, and we just have to ex accept that as the reality, and I'll point that out again. And here's, here's another side to this story about why we needed some different therapies, is that uh, the American population is rapidly aging as the baby boomer uh, group I'll raise my hand, I'm one of them, uh, is, is, is approaching uh, a more elderly uh, platform, so to speak. So from 19, 2010 to 2030, 30 million more Americans will be over the age of 65. And this is a disease of the elderly, so you can just see that this is a big demographic issue. Well, how do we first try to, to cope with this and, and tease some of these people into getting therapies when they were refusing surgery? And one was the idea of, of balloon valvuloplasty. And Alan Cribier, who's a main a French uh, interventional cardiologist and one of the main actors in this whole field, did the first balloon valvuloplasty in 1985. And uh, it's a good idea. And look at it, it made people feel better. Uh, the bars on the right are afterwards, and you can see that most of the patients go from uh, class three or four heart failure to class you know, one or two heart failure. The only problem was it didn't do them any good in terms of survival. So you see the people that just got uh, balloon valvuloplasty on the, on the lower bar there, they're dying at the same rate that people with medical therapy for aortic stenosis had historically died. So it made you feel better, but it certainly didn't prolong the length of your feeling better. Uh, as opposed to the people who had valvuloplasty and then went on to valve replacement, you can see that they're in a whole different category. So what was the next step in trying to deal with this? Well, if, let's see, if, if, if stents worked so well in the coronary arteries, maybe stents would work well in a valve. And the first guy to really think about this was a, was a, a Dane, uh, Dr. Hennig Anderson, and he uh, came up with the idea of putting a, a stent valve on a balloon and putting it in the valve and pushing the old valve aside and leaving that stent valve in place. And, uh, and he, they, they published this in 1989, uh, and he sold the patent for $10,000 to uh, uh, peripheral percutaneous valve technologies, which was owned by, which was founded by four people, and Ed, the Edwards Company subsequently bought that patent, and that's known as the Anderson patent, which was quite a little barrier for some of the other companies getting into this because uh, Medtronic paid nine hundred million dollars to Edwards to to escape the, the mm -hmm. you know the confines of that patent. So it was an important uh, little development. And so this were the, that was his pr uh, primitive little device at the beginning, but, and then as people got more sophisticated thinking about it, these are the stent valve devices that we're dealing with today. The two main ones are the one at the top, uh, the Edward Sapien valve, and then the one at the bottom, uh, the core valve. One is a balloon expandable valve. You crimp the valve on the balloon, put it in the aortic valve, blow up the balloon, you know, voila, you have uh, put the new valve in place. The other is a self-expanding valve, which is crimped in a, in a sheath. It's it delivered across the aortic valve. Then the sheath is slowly removed, and the valve flowers into place and pushes out the old valve. So these are just some of the historical milestones and why I say this is kind of a revolutionary technology. First uh, TAVR was done anagrade, in other words, transept puncture across the mitral valve up the aortic valve by Cribier in 2002. The first retrograde TAVR was done in, in Dallas, Texas, as a matter of fact. Um, and then 2005 was the first self-expanding valve in Europe. Uh, in, by 2006, uh, they had a better delivery system for the Edward Sapien valve, and both the Edward Sapien and the core valve got CE mark to be able to be sold in Europe in 2007. And now in 2011, the FDA approved the Edward Sapien, and in 2014, they approved the core valve. So we have FDA approval for the implantation of these two valves in high-risk patients. And by high-risk patients, we mean people in general that have more than a 7% expected mortality at 30 days with standard aortic valve surgery. So those, these, these, uh, 
these indications are acceptable in the United States today. And we all like to complain about the FDA and how it just delays and delays uh, effective therapies for, in, for patients in the United States. But when you really actually look at this, it's not too bad. It's actually fairly quickly that they've uh, allowed the adaptation of a, of a rather uh, remarkable technology. Okay, so with this slide just shows how the balloon expandable valve works. You cross the aortic valve with a wire. Uh, you put a curled wire in the ventricle and you bring this catheter up uh, across the aortic valve. When you think you're in the right place, you blow up the balloon. And it, and it illustrates two fundamental factors that allow this technology to take place. Uh, and, and the first one is that you don't need to cut out the old aortic valve. Somebody made the sinus of Valsalva as this perfect garbage bag gump for the, for the old aortic valve, and it just goes in there and stays there. Every now and then, very rarely, it will obstruct the coronary artery, but it's actually quite rare. And so that, that process of aortic valve replacement doesn't really need to be done. And the other thing is, once that valve's in place, because these valves are so calcified and rigid, that they lock the new valve in place and you don't get late embolization. That never really happens. So that are two major things that allow this technology to work. This is the, uh, the self-expanding uh, core valve system. And the other thing about this is unlike balloon valvuloplasty where you get a 50% reduction in the gradient and then if you look a month later or two months later or three months later, it's almost back to what it was before. Here the gradient goes away with both the Edward Sapien valve and stays away. Okay, so these are up to, up to a year and you see there's absolutely no change in the gradient. In fact, with, a, with stent valve placement, you get a lower gradient after your procedure than you do with surgical aortic valve replacement because you don't have the sewing ring in the place. And so it's a lower diameter valve profile and you actually get a better, better gradient post-procedure. So this is the first trial. The FDA is a stickler, as you know. Uh, it's one thing to say that something is pretty cool if you really have to show it. And so before these, this technology could be uh, uh, used in the United States, the FDA mandated that it be compared directly to surgery. And before you put it in inoperable patients, you have to compare it directly to medical therapy. And so that was the partner trial, a very, very well-run trial, very famous trial now. And what you can see, there were two cohorts. Cohort B, where we took people who are inoperable. Surgeons are not gonna operate on these people. I think you should go home, you know, make your peace, and that's that versus getting a stent valve, and then the other is a high-risk population where um, um, you are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to standard surgical aortic valve replacement versus stent valve placement, the so-called partner trial. But what did they find in the, in the cohort B? This is the inoperable patients versus medical therapy. What we found was that medical therapy is still just as bad in the current age as it was when Dr. Brownwald showed that slide. And you can see if you don't treat aortic stenosis, almost everybody's dead you know, by, by two years. And if you just look at rehospitalization and mortality, everybody's either back in the hospital or dead. So it's a nasty disease. It always has been, and it looks like it still is. And surprisingly, despite all these comorbidities, these people who are really too sick to have surgery, they actually benefited. And they had a lower mortality at two years with stent valve placement. So this is a dramatic treatment effect. And in the right patients, if you choose the patients correctly, even if they're too frail or sick to have surgery, if they're generally put together reasonably well otherwise, they will benefit from this. It was a dramatic effect. Two, two bad signals showed up. One is stroke, that there was more stroke, and I'm sorry this doesn't show up very much, but there was a signal that there's more stroke with the balloon manipulation and the valve placement than in medical therapy, obviously. And the other was vascular complications, that these were big catheters that were being used, 23, 26 French, and there were vascular complications. And if you had a vascular complication, uh, you had a 47% one-year survival rate, which was equal to medical therapy. And this is another, this is another point to take away about this type of therapy that you pay a price for everything you do wrong. And when you do something and injure an artery or you, or you injure a valve or you injure something in these really old people, you pay a price for it and they don't get better easily. They have almost no reserve. And so when you do these procedures, and I've been doing interventional cardiology for over 30 years and I've never been in a, in a, in a place where I have to do everything so perfectly as I have to do with aortic valve replacement because as I said, you pay a price. And the, you know, the other thing they showed was that it's actually fairly cost effective for every year of life saved about $50,000, which is about the same as dialysis. So even in this elderly patient group, it's not a, a ridiculous expenditure. Uh, uh, so let's look at when we compared it to surgery. This is the high risk group compared to surgery. You can see that at 12 months, there was absolutely no difference in survival. It was exactly the same. So in this group of patients, the balloon expandable valve was non-inferior to standard surgical aortic valve replacement in terms of survival. 
But again, we saw two signals that we were worried about. One was stroke. There was a little bit higher statistically significant increase in stroke and TIA in the group uh, that got the, the, the stent valves compared to surgery. Uh, another signal was, again, vascular complications. Uh, is much more common in the stent valve group, but of course in surgery there's an issue with bleeding, which uh, is, is much more prevalent than with stent valve placement. Do patients feel better? Yeah, they do feel better. Uh, so most of them are three, class three and four, a very sick group of patients. Most of them are class one and two. But we'll get back to this in a second. Um, not everybody gets better. These are people who have had their aortic valve replaced. They're high risk, not extreme risk. And you can see that even at one year, 25% of them are dead. You know, and uh, and then not everybody improves. There's still a group of patients that are class three and class four. So we still don't know how to choose these people completely correctly, and we have to do better with that. Uh, but by and large, uh, uh, this this is this is very positive data. A couple of things to be concerned about that appeared in these trials is is aortic regurgitation. Because you're not sewing in this valve, you can't eliminate aortic regurgitation. You blow up the valve, you try to size it correctly, you post dilate it if you need to, you try to squeeze it into the annulus correctly and hope that you don't have a lot of aortic regurgitation. And this is, there's been a lot of back and forth about this over the years of how to do this because you pay a price for aortic regurgitation. Here are people with moderate aortic regurgitation in red, and there are people with mild aortic regurgitation in yellow, and both of these have worse survivals than no regurgitation. And you might expect that in somebody who has severe aortic stenosis because their ventricles are thick and stiff and small. And so they will not tolerate the increased volume that comes from aortic regurgitation. So we're very meticulous about trying to eliminate that as, a, as an issue. So what were the conclusions after partner? Uh, inoperable patients who do not have life-threatening comorbidities and in whom vascular complications can be avoided do much better with TAVR than medical therapy. TAVR is not inferior to SAVR in high-risk patients, but there is a question of increased cerebral ischemia. And the transapical approach, where if you just have too much peripheral vascular disease to get these thick, big catheters up from below, you can go in through a transapical incision, uh, a mini thoracotomy, so to speak, tracks surgery actually pretty closely in terms of quality of life indexes. Uh, and, and the transapical approach is becoming much less popular now as, we, as some of these new generation devices are coming into play, as I'll talk about later. So this is the uh, self-expanding valve, the core valve. It's a little bit different. Um, you, you, as you expand this sheath, as you remove this sheath, this bottom part of the valve flowers out first, then the waste comes out, and then finally as you release the valve, this big large cage section opens up into the aorta itself and kind of anchors the valve. So you can have a valve that's kind of tipped away until you open up the valve and all of a sudden it'll just righten itself up and sit in there correctly. It doesn't do that all the time, but it does it enough to make it worthwhile. And we'll talk about how we made that better. And so the, the, the FDA, if nothing else, is very consistent. So they made, Med, made Medtronic do a randomized controlled trial against surgery, just like they made Edwards. And this was the so-called Medtronic core valve trial. And they, things had changed, however, because the inoperable group, which, uh, which they, uh, they called extreme risk in the Medtronic group couldn't really be compared with medical therapy uh, ethically because the partner trial had showed that you know, these are not comparable. This is much better. So they said you have to do a medical arm and you have to compare it historically to what they found in the partner trial as far as their sur surgically corrected group was. And so that was this arm. And then the other one was very standard one-to-one -one randomized comparison with surgery. So this was the, uh, the so-called extreme risk or inoperable group, and when that came in, they came in with a one-year mortality of 25%. Uh, in the partner B trial, the one-year mortality was 32%, so it wasn't any worse, that's for sure. Whether it's statistically better, I can't tell you that because of the way this data is organized, but nonetheless, that was a very satisfactory result, and people were very pleased to see that. Um, and, and it was a slightly different story with paravalvular regurgitation because this is a self-expanding valve and it keeps getting bigger, you know, all the time. So with the, with the balloon expandable valve, you blow it up to a certain place and it's not going to get any bigger after that. And so if, you're, if you have regurgitation, you're going to have to fix it another way. You're going to have to dilate it and make the valve even yet bigger with a bigger balloon and hope you don't rupture the annulus. Or you're going to have to plug it or something like that. But with the, with the self-expanding valve, you might say, I kind of got low, moderate, high, mild 
a regurgitation, I'm just going to watch this. And, and what they found was, in fact, if you do watch it, it tends to get better. So these are people with moderate regurgitation in that trial, and you can see that many of them then went to mild, and some of them went to trace, just as the valve sort of seats itself in the annulus but with, with the self-expanding property. Uh, and, it, and it seemed that in this trial, we didn't pay the same price for regurgitation as they did in the partner trial, uh, maybe because these valves are, are expanding. Uh, we don't really know the answer to that question yet. And we're going to talk about regurgitation and how we've dealt with it uh, with second generation valves a little bit more later. So going on to the high-risk trial, um, uh, compared one-on-one -on -one to surgery, as I said, this is a recurring theme. So even in this trial, if you were randomized to surgery, there were 38 patients that withdrew from the surgical group. They said, nope, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to have this operation. So this is, a, this is a continuing theme when you take care of these patients. So this was their results with surgery. You see they had a 19.1% as opposed to a 23 0.1% uh, uh, one-year mortality with surgical AO AVR, and that's not because we had better surgeons in the Medtronic trial than they had in the Edwards trial. It's because we treated slightly lower-risk patients. So the STS score was 11 in the, in the Edwards trial, and it was 7.7 .7 in the Medtronic trial, and that probably explains almost all of that. But this was the surprise. Here's the, here's the stent valve group. They had a mortality of 14.2%, and guess what? It was superior. So this was not in non-inferior, this was a superior result for the stent valve compared to surgery. Uh, and that may not be so surprising because, you know, aortic valve replacement is a traumatic event when it's done surgically. There's no doubt about it, especially in really elderly patients. So it doesn't completely surprise me that a less traumatic approach to this might actually translate into mortality benefit. But we'll, we'll, this is the only trial that's really showed that so far. We don't know how robust this effect is, and we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, and this mortality benefit has, it has carried out now to two years. This was data that was just presented in 2014 at 24 months. Now, how about stroke? Remember, we were worried when we heard the story with the partner trial that there was more stroke, possibly, which is a big concern. And it turned out that there really was not a, that much. In fact, it, at, at, at one year, there was a little bit more stroke in the surgery group than there was in the, in the, in the stent valve group. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's a big signal here that, uh, that stroke is something that's uh, going to uh, torpedo this technology. And again, the same thing, people got better by and large. Almost everybody's class one or two. Very few people are class three or four. So just comparing the two trials kind of head to head, uh, as you can see, the age is fairly similar. And this is the high risk population. This is where they come from. They're middle 80s and uh, with everything that comes along with that. And, uh, and you can see that the STS score was slightly higher in partner. Uh, and I can go into the reasons for that. It was really sort of an FDA mandated thing about how they wanted the high risk to be defined in one trial versus the other. Uh, they had a little bit more heart failure in partner. They had more prior cabbage, which really drives your STS score. There was more COPD in the core valve group and there was a little more frailty. And how about stroke? If you just look at this column, which is the one that makes the most uh, importance to me, is major stroke. A TIA I don't care about, really. A uh, minor stroke that you get better from, not so much, but major stroke is a bummer. So you can see the highest risk was the cohort B, the, the uh, inoperable group with partner. And then it sort of settles in on the other four groups that were compared, somewhere between 2.4 and 3.9%. So that's, I think, what we can say is probably the stroke risk with this. And it's comparable, in my opinion, to what you see with surgery. Um, and that's kind of how that's settled out. All right, well, where, where are we going now with this? Okay, so we got the high-risk people uh, pretty much understood that they'll do just as well, most likely, if you do the procedure correctly with uh, stent valve as, a, as opposed to surgery. And nobody, even people in their 70s or late 60s, are really nuts about having surgery, frankly. Uh, so how about intermediate risk group? And so if we're just learning about that now. We're going to learn a lot more about that this spring, I think. But this is a propensity analysis that was done from Europe where, we took, where they took people who got stent valves who actually were not terribly high risk, somewhere between 4% and 6%, and compared them to a surgery group that was exactly the same risk. There's a sort of a cohort of 1,200 people, and they whittled it down. Uh, to, uh, to, to make this propensity group uh, fit. And you can see that in this intermediate risk group, they're tracking right on top of each other. So the early signals suggest that in an intermediate risk group of patients, 30-day uh, risk, 3 to 7%, something like that, that stent valve placement may be an effective alternative to surgery as well. 
And here's how we're going to test that. This is the Sertavi trial, which is a one-to-one -one randomization in these intermediate risk patients to aortic stent valving versus uh, surgical aortic valve replacement with a two-year follow-up. Uh, and that trial is just about completed enrollment. And Partner, which was always ahead of us in core valve, the core valve world, has completed their intermediate risk trial, um, Partner 2B trial. And that probably, the enrollment stopped last October, and um, uh, oh, it was 2013 it stopped. So, so their follow-up period ends now, next month, and I suspect that this will probably be presented at ACC in March. So that will be very exciting to see that, and there will be a lot of interest in that. Okay, so are there patients that should not have TAVR? I know, I know this person very well. He's 92 years old. He's still enjoying a glass of wine as he sits around. He has severe aortic stenosis, and his major complaint is that he just doesn't have any energy. He really doesn't talk much about shortness of breath. Uh, he's had a 30-pound weight loss over the last year, um, but he has severe aortic stenosis on echo, and is this somebody whose valve we ought to replace? And uh, bender elderly people always complain of fatigue lots of times, and sometimes that's a symptom of severe aortic stenosis. I can tell you that we didn't replace his valve, and he was dead in three months. And he didn't die of aortic stenosis. He died of whatever else was causing this 30-pound weight loss and this tremendous frailty and an inability to feel warm in any, in, any, in any temperature. And he probably had metastatic cancer or something. So there, you know, it's very important that we really take a good look at these people and decide who we're going to put these valves in. And here's the sort of sobering fact of this. If you look at the summary of these trials, a summary of death or no improvement at six months after TAVR, and I think that's a reasonable definition of what, what something you shouldn't do. If somebody doesn't feel any better and they're dead, you know, you probably haven't had a big impact on their life by spending all that money. So if you look at the Partner 2B trial, that 46% of patients fell into that category in the, in the inoperable group. In Partner, uh, in the cohort A, 30% of patients fell into that group. In the lower risk group in the core valve trial, it was 28% in the extreme risk group or 24%. So even in the trial that is defining high risk most generously, we're still left with 14% of people that didn't get better or are dead at one year, and we really need to do better with that. Uh, and I'm just going to skip this slide because I just said what's on that slide. And these are the things from a whole bunch of different publications that kind of imply that you are, that that you're high risk no matter what you do. If you fix your aortic stenosis, you might not get better. Liver disease, a, a very high SDS score, especially greater than 15%. Severe lung disease, particularly oxygen dependent. Uh, severe myocardial fibrosis, if you were able to pick that up on an MRI scan. Uh, really bad ventricle. These are things that are black, uh, uh, you know, are, are red flags. That when you see people, even if they have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, they may not get a whole lot better no matter what you do, and you should pay attention to those. And there are also geriatric risk variables, frailty, like the patient that I showed you, disabilities, mobility and cognitive impairment, mood disturbance and social isolation. If you're depressed and your family wants you to have an aortic stent valve and you don't, guess what? You don't do very well because you're just not going to get with the ball game. You know, and you're just, you're, you're, and I've seen that several times where I, I had a couple of patients that I think just didn't make it because they were depressed and we didn't pay <coughs> enough attention to that. Okay, well, now, here we go. So the next generation is coming, and, uh, and so the, the valves I talked to you about were, were, were first generation, you know, first generation valves, and, and so the, the weaknesses of those systems, of course, have been addressed by thousands of engineers, and one of the weaknesses is vascular complications. Why do you have vascular complications? Because you have big tubes in small, tortuous, calcified arteries. So what are we going to do about that? We're going to make the tube smaller. So we've gone in the Edward Sapien world from a 24 French system. Um, where did that go? How did that come in? Anyway, it goes to a 14 French system. And, uh, and that's much bigger. That's like going from your forefinger to your little finger in terms of, uh, of what you're putting in the, in, in, the, in the femoral artery. And so that, that makes a big difference. And, uh, and the valve flexes like this so that it, you, know, it, it, you can manipulate it through the ascending aorta. Uh, and it, in, um, and that, that's also something that eases replacement. No, no I need to go this way. And the other thing was, remember, we were really worried about perivalvular leak with this valve because we showed that it wasn't well tolerated. But what they did was in this next generation, the so-called S3 valve, they added a little skirt, a cloth skirt underneath here, and they've almost eliminated perivalvular leak. 
uh, aortic regurgitation post procedure with that because it sort of it sort of seals the annulus much better, and that, that's made a, a big a big difference. So those are really nice improvements. Um, there's the uh, they, they did a, a trial, the S3 trial, and uh, and the FDA has approved this new S3 generation valve, and so this is available to be placed in in American patients at this time. Um, and I, this just points out that the paravalular leak was really, was really quite well tolerated. Unfortunately, there's a price for that. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but in the self-expanding valve, the Medtronic valve, it sits lower in the annulus, and so it presses on the conduction system, and the, and the, the need for a permanent pacemaker after core valve implantation it has ranged from anywhere between 15 to 40 percent, depending on the trial. Whereas in the Edwards world, it was more like around 6, 7, 5 percent, something like that, until they added the skirt <laughs> and got rid of the... Uh, of the paravalvular leak, uh, and then their pacemaker rate started to go up from 6% to 13%. The first three patients that we implanted an S3 uh, valve, and each of them developed complete heart block. Uh, so it's, it is an issue, and uh, we'll just have to deal with it and, and understand it a little bit more. But uh, I think in general, if you're 85 years old and you end up with a permanent pacemaker, that's not the end of the world. So the Evolute system, this is the second generation self-expanding valve. This is the Evolute R system. I was privileged to be able to implant the first of this type of valve, both experimentally and commercially in the United States. And it's a really, really nice valve. There are a couple of great things about it. One, it's really small, too. It's gone down from 18 French to 14 French. And, um, and it's repositionable. So if I place it and I don't like it, I can retrieve it and put it someplace else. It's too deep, the implantation, I can grab that valve and pull it up. If it pops out, you know, and I put it in because I planted it too high, I just retrieve it and put it in a little lower. That is an enormous safety factor, and we, we use that and are very pleased about that. This also has a little skirt on the end to try to reduce the perivalvular leak. Um, and, uh, and this is a, a very nice system as well. So this is just an example of how you can retrieve it. You know, I've flowered it out, I don't like it, and I just flower it back in, so to speak, and, uh, and then put it someplace else. Uh, safety, uh, also, you know, because it's repositionable, I think that we reduce the need for permanent pacemaker with the self-expanding system. Because instead of, say, flowering out and then jumping down low and then impacting the conduction system, if it does that, I just retrieve it and pull it back up. And so we reduce this now uh, to around 11 percent, and I think we'll have to see. This is all preliminary data, not a lot of patients. We'll have to see if in the long run these two pacemaker rates end up being comparable or whether there is a real advantage one way or another. We'll just have to see. So this just points out the, the fact that if you implant the valve too low, you're more likely to get a pacemaker. The people in red got pacemakers. This is the depth of implantation. And you can see that the red is, you know, is, is definitely associated with a deeper implant. So to be able to reposition that gives you a safety margin. Uh, Perivalvular regurgitation has not been a big problem with the Evolute valve as well, but we don't tolerate it. This is really an operator-driven decision. We don't tolerate moderate aortic regurgitation. So we post-dilate the valve, we do whatever we need to do, or we bring the patient back later if we can't do that and actually put a vascular plug in to, to eliminate that. And I think that's just a matter of clinical uh, judgment. These are some of the other systems that are coming down. Uh, they're not going to, just like there aren't two cars in America, they're not going to be two stent valves. So uh, the Boston Scientific Corporation has the Lotus valve system, which they're in active trial right now. Uh, it looks like it's a pretty good valve, but it does have a fairly high pacemaker implantation rate, but almost no AI. Uh, so we'll see how that's going. This is another valve that's kind of cool called, called the direct flow valve, uh, which comes as a big floppy cloth, and then you inflate it with saline, and it, and it takes its shape in the aorta. And if you, if you don't like it, you pull the saline off, and it becomes a big floppy cloth again, and then you put it someplace else and do it again. And if you really like it, then you inject it with an epoxy, and that epoxy makes it rigid and firm. And that that's, valve has been used in Europe a fair amount, uh, and, uh, and that, that's in trial in the United States as well. And finally, um, another thing I think that people have really benefited from with this stent valve technology are people who have already had surgery. So they had an aortic prosthesis that was put in at 68 or 72, and now they've got at 84 severe aortic stenosis or they have severe AI or whatever. And you can then take these patients and they have a beautiful sewing ring that's in place. They have a wonderful annulus that's uh, you know made out of whatever they make them out of, metal, I don't know what they make them out of, that cloth ring. And the valve will sit in there very nicely. So you can, instead of having to reoperate these people who are older now, you can put these the, uh, stent valve inside. They get very good results uh, at a very acceptable 
uh, operative uh, risk. So I think that's, that's a big advance as well. And we also are doing it, as a matter of fact, in the mitral position. If your mitral valve wears out, you can put a aortic stent valve, you turn it around the other way, and you put it in the mitral valve. And that's, again, you've got a sewing ring in there, and it will sit, and it will sit. Most of the people have been doing this uh, transapically, but we've started now doing it trans, uh, trans um, septally, so we go across the septum, and so we never have to even make an incision, and we've done about 10 of those now, and they've actually worked out quite well. So in conclusion, I think percutaneous valve therapies are becoming widely available. They're clinically effective and usually promote faster recovery than standard surgical techniques. They are cost-effective, or at least equivalent, compared to both surgery and medical therapy. And appropriately selected, they allow reduced suffering in high risk and improved survival in inoperable patients. Cohort C, the patients who are dying um, with, not of, aortic stenosis must be defined and denied for futility, obviously. And even in cohort B, uh, patients must be clit critically selected because there's just no point in, in, uh, in, in having a procedure that really doesn't accomplish something. And if patient selection makes a difference, we, we need to focus on that. So procedural complications, as I mentioned before, must be scrupulously avoided uh, by choosing appropriate access sites and with meticulous attention to detail. And uh, the expansion to intermediate risk must be done by randomized trials and not creep. In Europe, it's creeped down into the intermediate risk population. But in the United States, I think we're holding the line fairly well, and we're going to make that decision based on pretty solid scientific evidence from randomized trials. So thank you very much for your attention. Before the, before the questions, I have some disclosures. Dr. Grubb has working relationship with Edwards Life Sciences and Medtronic. I had one question. Um, with, with the newer technology of valves and the reduced complication rate, plus the possibility of, of expanding the population we can put them in, do you see this coming to the community hospital program anytime soon? Well, I think if you have a... Um, you know, a reasonably sex, sex, successful aortic valve, surgical aortic valve program, um, then I think that you have to consider, you know, adopting this technology. Uh, I, I think that, especially if it gets well adopted with intermediate risk, you're talking probably 50% of the people that are eligible for aortic stent valve replacements. And if you're, if you're doing 50 aortic valves, you might be doing 25 <laughs> unless, you, unless you figure out to, how to add this. And if you do add it, you'll be doing 75 or 100. Uh, and plus, you'll be serving your community, which I think is very important. Dr. Kendra Grepp, do you have something to add? Well, I, one of the things that is a challenge when we talk about the uh, lower risk groups is this question of durability. And, and how do you address this with your patient population? Because certainly as a surgeon, I can tell them that if I put in a surgical valve, it's, yes, you're going to have a sternotomy, but that valve is going to last you 15 years. This valve, clearly, we can't say that. No, and the funny thing is because it's being implanted in such elderly people, it's actually really difficult, even if they get a great result, you know, to, to get 10-year survival on them because if you're starting out at 87 or 88, the likelihood you're going to live to 98 or 99 isn't, you know, 100%, that's for sure. So there haven't been huge numbers of patients that have actually gotten out 10, 15 years. I don't know anybody that's gotten 15 years. And so we just don't know the answer to that question. And uh, so I tell them I don't know the answer to that question. And... Um, uh, and I think it's much more important in intermediate risk. I don't really go into it a lot with people with high risk because I think we don't have any signal that these valves are wearing out in that group of people. I mean, I know some anecdotal reports of a core valve that, you know, went sour at, th at three years or something, but they're just anecdotal reports uh, and, and, and no really collected series. But with the intermediate risk, you're absolutely right. We have to, we have to be upfront and honest about that. Yes, Dr. Helmy. Um, well, I think, you know, we, we heard from the, uh, from the LVAD people and all this, the importance of a team, and I think that in, in this area, not only is it really important, but it's mandated, you know, by CMS. You cannot put in, a surgeon cannot put in a scent valve by himself, and neither can an interventional cardiologist. You are linked at the hip with your surgeon, so you better get along with them. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> And because both of you have to be at the table, both of you bill, both of you get paid. And if one person does it, that doesn't apply. So they really wanted to build in this whole concept of the team, and it's a good idea. What we do, we have a valve clinic. 
and I know at Columbia they, they did this as well. And, uh, you know, so patients who are eligible for this, they come to the valve clinic, they're seen by the, the interventional cardiologist, there's myself, they're seen by the surgeon, in this case, Dr. Williams. And, uh, and we sometimes we have a geriatrician. If we are concerned about frailty, we'll send them for a very formal frailty analysis, whether a geriatrician. Uh, and we, you know, we try to sort of sniff out, you know, what we think is the best thing. Um, I think the thing you have to, the biggest hurdle you have to overcome in, uh, in having a team like this is you have to be fair, you know, in the, in the sense that the surgeon can always be thinking, I want to operate, and the interventionist always be thinking, I want to implant a stent valve. You know, at some point you have to reach a consensus about, you know, yep, this person's old, this is high risk, they, need, they should get a stent valve. This person's young, he's fairly robust, you know, et cetera, et cetera, he's really better with a surgical valve. This person has, you know, moderate rheumatic mitral stenosis plus, you know, aortic stenosis, and, uh, and th that person probably needs surgery and two valves replaced. You know, so you, you have to be open-minded and fair, and I think at the end of the day, and I've always sort of tried to practice medicine this way, is you have to do what's right for the patient, whether it's you as an individual doctor or you as a team. And, uh, uh, but I think that the patients appreciate the concept of a team, and they feel that they have a lot of cardiologists that are on board with the right care for them rather than just, you know, hit or miss that, you know, I hope this guy was thinking right today when I went to see him. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Slater. It was well, an excellent talk. <laughs>